Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy, and I am here, as usual, with my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? I'm doing good. We have an early morning recording session, and we are chatting about one of my least favorite topics ever, Justin Sun, and how annoying and awful he is. There was a nice, big, huge piece in The Verge about just kind of what a scumbag he is. So let's let's just start there. Uh, actually, let's not start with how big of a scumbag he is. We'll build to that. Let's talk about who Justin Sun is, what he does, why he's a big name in cryptocurrency, which is the only place he could ever be a big name because he's just a gross scammer. So anyway, go ahead. Justin Sun is like the king degen of crypto Twitter and of crypto in general. The creator of the Tron protocol, which he created by basically taking um, the implementation of one of the Ethereum clients, changing a couple parameters and calling it Tron. He came up with their English language white paper by copying and pasting together several other white papers and uh, launched the shitcoin Tron onto the world where it has continued to serve as a somewhat functional level one for those who just don't want to pay Ethereum fees and are okay with engaging with Justin's debauchery. And it's not the only coin that he has. Let's be clear about that. He's got just, he's got so many coins. He's got Just Token. He's got BTT Token. He's got Tron. He's got DAOs. He's got, he, he was buying silver when silver was going up he was buying amc when amc was going up he was buying gamestop when gamestop was going up if it's going up justin is buying it if it's going down justin is holding it that's how this man works and like he's in and out of like the super high yield super ponzi nomics things all over tron there's people who like try to guess and track which his wallets are because you'll see like a billion dollars on tron suddenly be deposited into a new protocol and someone's like oh justin survived he's gonna suck up the yield until the protocol's dead and like that's literally what happens and then he hops over to other chains like ethereum and tries to use his frankly astonishing stack of cash to try to like buy governance votes and manipulate other things let's back up a little bit because i think we're we're getting ahead of ourselves because we just dislike this guy so much let's start let's start a little earlier here uh justin sun is his english name that is not his chinese name his chinese name is sun yu chen he i don't know exactly his his early childhood backstory but i do know that he went to jack ma's school at some point he went to the like one of the pri prime universities of Beijing, apparently. I don't, no one's confirmed this, so I don't know if this is true. This is the story he tells. He went to one of the best universities in Beijing, graduated, and then went to University of Pennsylvania, which is an Ivy League school. Again, I've never heard anyone confirm that, but that is what he says he did, so we'll run with it. Um, but he got a history degree or something like that at University of Pennsylvania. None of this is applicable to what he's doing now. It's really odd that he like then went to like Jack Ma's school and got into coding. And I mean, I don't think he can code, probably. I don't think he can do any of the stuff that has been implemented on Tron. I think he's like the pretty boy face of it. But then he left China, came to America after he started Tron. And that's that's where this article, we're gonna link to the article. So you should you should read the article if you get an opportunity. But I think that's where things start to get weird is when he, he exits China. So why did he leave China? Well, my understanding is he left China because the political regime became much less favorable to people doing things like running questionable ICOs. And so he left because he was worried about his future in China as he had just completed the Tron ICO. Yeah, so here he has hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever he's accumulated by putting out this essentially illegal initial coin offering. And then he flees China, he comes to America, he's in San Francisco, and the stories get even weirder from there. It seems like a lot of employees are having weird interactions with this guy. Seems like he's threatening people all the time. Um, like he's a bit unhinged even. I don't know, just from, from what I was reading, just, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it does seem unhinged. At the very least, it seems like Justin's son is extraordinarily ambitious and self-interested. And so he is willing to push people to do things that they might not generally do if he believes it's going to benefit him. And he loves to 
twist and manipulate things so that they will benefit him. So he comes to San Francisco and he makes a decision shortly thereafter that, and this, I remember this distinctly, to buy BitTorrent, which if you're unfamiliar with BitTorrent, I assume everyone is familiar, but if you're unfamiliar, it's a... It's what's called a torrenting network. It they, they basically, you can upload files and share them with people and those people can download them for free, right? This is like very similar to like Napster and LimeWire and things that we had early internet days, but it's still functional. And he decided to buy it. it, it it's not like some big money maker for anybody. Um, but his reason for buying it was that he was going to implement a token. He was going to tokenize BitTorrent. But again, let's jump back to the article and talk about what, what happened there. I want to pause. He, Justin Sun, cannot buy the BitTorrent protocol for the same reason like no one can buy the Bitcoin protocol, right? It's just a protocol that exists and can be used. What he actually ended up buying was the BitTorrent company, which issued just one and not even the most commonly used like client to use the BitTorrent file sharing network. And then he proposed that they add this token system on top to try to incentivize people to seed or share the files to try to make file sharing better. After purchasing BitTorrent, according to the article, he came back to the office and started really hyping himself up and at one point referred to himself as Chairman Mao and calling all the other C-suite executives there his generals and how that they were going to massacre their competition as they came out and did this. My favorite part of that is that one of the employ one of the employees then goes up to Justin's son and says, "Hey, <laughs> didn't didn't all of Mao's generals get killed by Mao?" And Justin's son's response is, "Yeah, yeah. Like, what is going on, dude? <laughs> Some of you may die, but that's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make. It just." It's just epically intense. It's like every horror story we've heard about this guy for years. And, and you know, some of you, again, may not be familiar with this guy. Hopefully you're not. Hopefully you've never heard of Justin Sun. And you, you know what? Turn off the podcast and just be free. Don't don't bother learning about this if you can avoid it. But if you know about him at all, I mean, this guy has been influential with his wealth, but also a dick, just a total dickhead. Everybody sees how he's behaving and it's not, no one is like, ha, that's a cool guy I'd love to hang out with. And you go, this seems like there's a lot of red flags and problems with this guy. And with these article after article coming out, because this is not the first article about what a shithead he is, it just confirms more and more of, of our biases, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, we talked about in the Russia-Ukraine uh, episode about how he went on Twitter and responded to the Ukraine Twitter handle, the handle for this war-torn country that had just been invaded by a nuclear power, to say, hey, make sure if you do this airdrop that people who used Tron tethers get their airdrop. We wouldn't want them to be excluded. So petty, dude. So petty. The most petty thing you could imagine. Obvious to me that all he cares about is money. Like, I think to outsiders, and I hate to say something like this because I, I think it's important that we don't dehumanize people like this. Like, it's important to see the humanity in Justin Sun so that we don't do the same kind of fucked up things that he's doing, right? But I will say that when you're at this level of all I care about is money, it makes outside observers go like, that does not seem normal. And I think, you know, greed is is slightly normal, but that level of greed is just, it's hard to watch, man. And talking about greed and the desire for ever more increasing money, one of the most interesting accusations in the article for me was the accusation that Tron employed a market-making firm, is how it was described, but that this firm seemed to be engaged in outright market manipulation. Uh, Justin would give them non-public information about things that were expected to benefit Tron so they could purchase in anticipation of it and sell after the news. Justin would communicate with them about a certain price he wanted Tron to be at a certain time, and they would help make that happen. And uh, it seems like Justin and this market-making firm are engaged in just outright and blatant market manipulation. 
insider trading and market manipulation. Yeah. And I think the go-to response, as as is clear in this article, there's kind of two go-to responses in the space generally. And I, this is not just Justin Sun that does this. This is like, I, I think a lot of people do this. There's, well, there are no regulators yet. Is insider trading illegal in cryptocurrency? Yes, it is illegal, asshole. But... If if that's if that's the if that's the argument you want to run with first of all that you're wrong but second argument that I've seen and this I almost want to say is more common is spray and pray like just go man just run as hard and as fast as you can breaking as many things as you possibly can as you go along if you break all the rules you're going to be okay and I don't know if that's right either but I know that from our experience here it's clear that regulators usually do not punish these people in the ways that would perhaps hinder criminals from wanting to do it again. Perhaps, though I have thoughts on this specific case that I think we'll get to a little later in the episode. But yeah, and I think the other thing to remember is that like, even if it is not illegal, it is still immoral and unethical. And it is very much okay to call out people for doing bad things, even if the bad things are not against the law or not clearly against the law. You don't need to accept bad people doing bad things just because the law may not specifically cover this specific construction of that bad thing. Really though, also if you think that insider trading and market manipulation aren't gonna be covered because crypto, you're insane whatever on that. I think we we also forgot to bring up the the fact that when he did the BTT thing, when he bought BitTorrent, he was keen on this token and his lawyer, his chief compliance officer who was this guy who previously had worked with the SEC for like a decade or something. Th this this lawyer says to Justin, "No fucking way, man. You cannot do it. It's highly illegal and unethical and just don't do it." And Justin says, you're fired, basically, or he resigns or whatever. The guy resigns. And and then Justin does what a lot of people in crypto, I think, also do, which is goes to find a person who will say yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Justin Sun, after the initial ICO of TRX and before the BTT ICO, wanted to find a former member of the SEC who would be able to write an opinion claiming that these tokens were utility tokens and not securities. He hired David Labhart to be the chief compliance officer for BitTorrent, writing this opinion, which Justin hoped would protect him from any later action by the SEC if it were to occur. It is very similar to me to some of the techniques we saw Binance and Binance US use when they were hiring like David Brooks out of the CFTC to try to provide them with that same kind of artificial aura of we're taking this seriously. And the former regulator had a similarly short stint there as they did here. And then Justin did exactly what you said. He went from lawyer to lawyer until he found one he was able to give enough money and who had enough lack of sense to agree to write what he needed to be said. And Justin did another ICO. Justin Sun exits China. He's clearly running away from going to prison. He ends up in San Francisco. He does BTT and all this other stuff. But what we also haven't mentioned yet is that he purchases what at the time was one of the most well-known cryptocurrency exchanges around that had reasonable amounts of volume, I think, maybe not so much at that point by the time he was getting his hands on it, but very well-known cryptocurrency exchange called Poloniex. And what does Justin Sun do with Poloniex? Well, yeah, so Poloniex was one of like the OG crypto exchanges, famous for its troll box, where traders would be able to like send messages to each other while they were trading these shit coins. Circle acquired it in 2018 and they updated the compliance procedures and made all the traders on it go through know your customer checks. At that point, the volume on Poloniex dropped from like pretty meaningful to basically nothing. And Circle pretty quickly afterwards was looking to dump it leading to Justin Sun's acquisition. First thing Justin does is immediately start restructuring the company, trying to put it behind a bunch of holding companies across several different jurisdictions in a very Binance-esque regulatory arbitrage type strategy. He especially liked that part of it was structured in the Seychelles, which he thought would be a challenging place for users to sue the exchange. He then starts changing some other things. Uh, we mentioned that Circle instituted new KYC procedures and that had 
killed the volume. Allegedly, as described in this article, Justin's son encouraged the employees of Poloniex to start faking the KYC so that it would stop being an impediment to Poloniex adoption in China. They had an automated service that they claimed was doing these checks on people's documents, but people familiar with the system said that it would rubber stamp basically any document you saw, with one employee saying even if it was an ID of Daffy Duck, which aside is hilarious to me because for people who remember the New York Department Financial Services bit license, uh, toss up with Bittrex. One of their claims about Bittrex is that Bittrex was letting Donald Duck trade on their exchange, uh, Donald Duck and Elvis Presley. And so some things never change. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the end of the, the Poloniex tale, really, because they're, as, as gross as that is and as illegal as it probably is, what I think is Almost more horrifying is what he does with what they have called dust, which it's it's not exactly dust what they're talking about. Sorry, let me just explain what dust is to anybody who's interested. Dust, <laughs> let's say I have half a Bitcoin. I send uh, or I send, let's say I send, uh, he doesn't want half a Bitcoin. He wants 0.49 Bitcoin. So I send him 0.49 Bitcoin. And now I have 0.01 Bitcoin left to even send that 0.01 Bitcoin Many times the transaction fees, the amount of money I would have to spend to even try to send that Bitcoin would exceed the cost of the Bitcoin that I'm trying to send. So when you reach that kind of a situation, they refer to that as dust, right? These these tiny amounts of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency that you basically can't remove from your wallet because there's just not enough of it to actually be able to move it. But what this was at Poloniex, it wasn't dust exactly. No, well, at least not all of it. So um, based on the reporting by The Verge, it seems as though most of it was from their Tether deposit address. Tether, initially, as we've talked about, was primarily on the Omni layer on top of Bitcoin. And so to transact in Tether, you'd actually be sending a Bitcoin transaction that included some additional instructions in the op return part of the transaction that allowed Omni clients to determine what to do with the Tethers in your account. Practically, what this means is that Tether deposit addresses will gradually over time accumulate the little bit of Bitcoin that needs to be included for the transaction. Besides that, it was not uncommon for people to make mistakes and accidentally deposit Bitcoin Bitcoin into the Tether deposit address. This amount seems to have been the lion's share of the 300 BTC that Poloniex ended up getting together. They talk about finding it in other places, so I imagine there were old deposit addresses, old hot wallets, old pieces of their infrastructure where they ended up finding the keys and finding a little bit of BTC left, but it was primarily from this Tether deposit address. What allegedly seems to have occurred is that Justin started pressuring Poloniex to give him those millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And at some point, we see those 300 Bitcoin go to an anonymous wallet and then come back to the Poloniex hot wallet. And so it seems quite likely that Justin exfiltrated several hundred Bitcoin from this exchange he purchased that were not in any meaningful sense his. And that's key to me, is that th this is essentially $10 million worth of Bitcoin we're talking about here. It's not his money. And we've seen, this is another thing that we've seen from cryptocurrency exchanges and protocols regularly. This is not something new where they decide, you know what, we're going to just take our customers' funds and use them however we want. We've seen it with a lot of fraudulent exchanges, one being Quadriga CX, for instance, where Gerald just Gerald and Michael did whatever they wanted. Sure feels like Bitfinex and Tether kind of seem to operate in a similar fashion oftentimes. Crypto Capital Core's 10% fund that Reggie siphoned off. And quite honestly, I'm sure that there's, uh, I, like, let's not pretend like BitMEX probably wasn't doing the exact same kind of thing. Um, I don't think any of these people are, I think they, they, if I want to not look at it as evil, they probably believe like, I'm good at this. I'm better than my customers at this. I'm going to make so much money. There's no way this can go wrong, which might be true, but it's also disgusting and gross that they're doing it. At times, it seemed like that's what uh, Patrin thought, like reading some of his posts on Reddit when he was posting his Mike XBT, that like he literally thought like, and, and Jerry Cotton at times, too, when they were doing their trading with customer funds, they legitimately seem to believe it was a low risk endeavor because it's not like they're going to lose. So now we've we've gotten through most of this. We got through Justin starting Tron, leaving China, ending up in San Francisco, 
buying Poloniex and BitTorrent. And then just as everything, as he's buying everything he possibly can, as he's flaunting his wealth, like buying lunches with Warren Buffett and and taking pictures from his, his penthouse office suite, suddenly everything gets thrown into the wind again. Yeah, so this is like when he, the belief is he begins to feel pressure from U.S. law enforcement and U.S. regulators, and he has to kind of go to ground again. This is around the time, I believe, that he ends up canceling his initial lunch with Warren Buffett, citing uh, kidney stones, I believe. And he starts to seem to make certain amends with China. He writes a piece about uh, blockchain for the like official Chinese party app that people are required to read from. He gets um, some academic advisor position or something at the Central Party School for the CCP. And uh, the article describes some conversation he starts to have with some individual in China. Oh, yeah, the llama. <laughs> yes, the llama who he had to get two uh, Google Fi phones for, uh, Brother Rainbow, his contact inside of China, who employees who worked with Justin believed was helping protect Justin from the CCP. And this is another weird, just quickly, I, we're getting into so many weird and differing things that I feel like I need to quickly explain. I assume most of our listeners are familiar with the Dalai Lama, who is kind of the figurehead for Tibetan Buddhism. What you may not be familiar with is that the Dalai Lama was forced to flee Tibet in the 1950s, 1940s, 1940s, and the Chinese government decided we get to pick the Dalai Lama now. They've selected their own Dalai Lama. Then the Dalai Lama has like the next successor and the next successor is called the Panchen Lama. And so this rainbow dude is like one of the assistants to these people. So he's like a higher up in this fake Chinese Tibetan Buddhism sect, which I guess is important because China really wants to make sure that they maintain control of Tibet. Um, so... That just for some context as to who Brother Rainbow is, that's that should give you a little context. He's he's a figure. He's a, an assistant for the fake figurehead for the fake Tibetan Buddhism in China. Complex. Sorry, but there we go. The number that they found associated with these phones that Justin gave Brother Rainbow seemed to have been associated with someone named Luo Dan, who had previously been an adjunct professor in Tibetan studies and had worked with the party-aligned China-Tibet outlet. So what we're trying to say is that he is a useful appendage of the Chinese Communist Party in terms of advancing their aims and especially in advancing these specific beliefs they need to be propagated to the populace in order to maintain their circle of influence. And Justin now seems to have reconnected with at least that part of the CCP's information outlet and uh, is strengthening those connections, which is weird. It's it's unsavory again and uncouth again, right? It's kind of like, wow, um, you went from being a douchebag rich bozo to being a communist party puppet. I feel like people are almost at this point where they're just laughing and they're like, this is so funny. Like this, this moron scammer is like a multi-billionaire. Isn't that hilarious? And I'm like, it's not that hilarious. No. Yeah, it's not that funny, actually. It's kind of, it's like really sad. And so he, sorry, I know, went off on a tangent there. But so he goes back to China, kisses their ass. But clearly that doesn't exactly work the way he wants it to either. Because there's other stuff going on now still. Well, yeah, let's talk about the places he has citizenship, right? <laughs> it might be almost easier to just say the, the four countries he doesn't have citizenship to or whatever. Like, so he, he gets citizenship in Malta after setting up Tron Limited there and gets his parents citizenship in Malta as well. He ends up with Granada citizenship and is now, of course, the permanent Gren Granada Dean ambassador to the World Trade Organization, of course. Uh, he's got passports from like St. Kitts and Nevis, passports from, oh God, there were so many places in the article. There's places that weren't even mentioned. Like they didn't even mention Granada as as him having citizenship there, but we know he does because he, he got that diplomatic immunity. So clearly yeah. he has citizenship like I can only guess in like anywhere between five and 10 countries, but the last and most important one seems to be Guinea-Bissau, which is a tiny West African country 
that does not have an extradition policy with the United States or China. So it's his Hail Mary is my guess. It's his his Hail Mary. God, I hope he ends up there. I really do. I hope he ends up there. Well, and, and the other thing I thought was really striking about this, like besides the fact that he's getting citizenship in all these places, is the number of bank accounts they suggested he controlled, right? That he had control over at least 13 bank accounts in the United States. And after he got the Maltese citizenship, he used the fact that they were in the EU to apply for like eight or 10 more bank accounts across Europe. And he's acting like a money launderer. Like if you describe someone with passports in all these countries opening up bank accounts in these jurisdictions and moving these amount of dollars. I I think the citizenship thing is very money launderer-esque, but I do th- I do wonder to myself how common it is for hyper wealthy people to have 10 or 12 or 15 bank accounts. Like it wouldn't surprise me if that's like a normal super wealthy thing to do. So I don't know how much of that is actually an important part of the story. But I do think getting five to 10 different citizenships and opening up different bank accounts in five or 10 countries, that is very, very weird. And that is probably money laundering. Or or at the very least, we don't know that Justin's a money launderer. We're not saying he's a money launderer. He just kind of looks like one if you squint. Uh, the other thing it could be, and one of his like previous employees suggested this in the article, is that he's um, kind of obsessed with tax avoidance, with tax evasion, with doing everything he can to minimize his taxable wealth. And so part Which of this again gets into what I was talking about. is a very common, like, that isn't... Yeah. That's that's not Justin's son. That's fucking Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, too. Like, he's not alone. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Listen to our episode on the Pandora Papers if you want. But yeah, and so some of it, there's a chance that it's money laundering, but there's also a good chance it's him trying to do structuring to minimize his tax load, right? He's picking up as many low-tax jurisdictions as he can, getting the accounts there, moving the funds. And and that gets into the FBI and the IRS. Yeah, which is, this is the last, this is the last thing on this, which after all these years and all these billions of dollars and us repeating that... God, why is no one looking at Justin Sun? And the fact we had hadn't seen this until right now is frustrating, but also not surprising to us that yeah, the FBI is interested in Justin Sun. Who'd a thunk? Yeah, and so. The article appears to reveal that Justin Sun is under a pretty active investigation by both the FBI and the IRS, who believe that he's involved in, at the very least, criminal criminal tax evasion, it appears, along with perhaps some other things. And this is what I was talking about when I said earlier, there's some hints to me that we might be on the edge of enforcement actions. And I know I've said this before, and I'm probably wrong. I'm going out on a limb here that's probably going to crack and drop me to the ground. But the Tether executives have gotten letters for bank fraud. Reggie Fowler has decided not to take the plea deal and is going to trial in a few months. Justin's son is being investigated by the FBI and the IRS. Basically, every major DeFi protocol of note has gotten letters or subpoenas from the SEC in the last few months. It's not necessarily clear to me, and we talked about this a little bit with uh, Jason Brawl when he was on, that we're ever going to get like a Black Friday type enforcement event in cryptocurrency. But we know Justin's son is close to CZ. We know CZ is being heavily scrutinized. We know Justin's under investigation. We know the crypto capital execs are about to go to trial, and we know the Bitfinex and Tether execs are likely to be. There's a good chance. There's a good chance they got target letters. There's a good chance they get indicted in the nearish future. That's a lot of key cryptocurrency executives. That's a lot of key players in the industry. Yeah. 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 And look, I think I get it. I get that the running narrative has been if you move fast enough and break enough things, the government will just find you and, and move on because it's been true. I mean, it's 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 hard to argue with that. Uh, Because you look at EOS or you look at like any number, really, like so many people have been slapped with with these giant fines, but that's what they're they're being slapped with. They're being slapped with giant fines. And that is not going to stop multi-billion dollar criminals from continuing to earn multi-billions of dollars, especially when you're fining them 150 million or something and they made billions, right? You're essentially telling them exactly what their profit margins are going to be for running a scam. And I think we're for breaking all the rules. It makes sense that Justin and CZ and these other schmoes are so confident that all they have to do is keep moving faster than law enforcement and they're fine. 
Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in our uh, Fuck the SEC episode that when you fail to appropriately punish white-collar crime, it ends up becoming just like an expected cost of doing business. And you're talking about like $100 million fines and stuff like that, but like the Block One where they raised $4 billion, their fine ended up being like $24 million or $25 million or something like that. Like it was so small compared to the billions of dollars they had raised. Well, what was the largest fine ever? Who had to pay that? BlockFi. Oh, BlockFi, BlockFi. BlockFi that's right. BlockFi had the big $100 million one. Though that was partially to state regulators to settle it too. And even then, okay, they've been accepting billions of dollars. Do you think that your $100 million fine is going to give them any pause at all? Because I don't think so. I, I mean, I think it gave them pause in terms of offering some of these things to U.S. persons, right? Like BlockFi stopped accepting deposits from U.S. persons for that product and announced their intention to eventually come up with the registered regulated version, though we'll see if that ever appears. I have my skepticisms. Mm -hmm. I think I'm cautiously optimistic that Justin Sun is going to get in big, big trouble. I think if anyone has been incredibly brazen and kind of stupid about their behavior and antics in a public sense, it's Justin Sun. Even CZ, who I really don't like either, does a better job of keeping his mouth shut when he needs to, when he needs to. Uh, Justin Sun doesn't have that filter. I think we've talked about it when it comes to like BitMEX and BitMEX getting in trouble. And all of them, I mean, they all pleaded out now, right? I think all of them have pleaded out. So being cocky maybe looks really cool and wins you some points on Twitter or whatever, but is it worth jail time? And Justin, I hope I hope it's worth it for you, buddy. Or I hope it's worth a lifetime of living in Guinea-Bissau, one of the poorest countries in the world. I'm just waiting for the day when he has to either run away to the, one of the poorest nations in the world, which is its own prison. The other prison, which is real life prison, that's cool too. I highly suspect it's gonna be one of those. And I'm not usually very confident in people getting arrested and doing jail time. It's actually not something I'm very confident in at all when it comes to crypto anymore. But Justin, I'm pretty damn confident. Yeah, let's just go out on that. That's a good ending. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed that. If you did enjoy it, please leave a rating or a review for the podcast. It helps us out a lot. And also donate Tron to our Tron wallet address. You can find that. No, I'm just missing, guys. Thank you. Bye.